We begin in West Africa, where the chairman of the Nigerian Labour Congress Political Commission, Komu Titus Amba, has expressed deep concern over the turmoil gripping the Labour Party, emphasizing that the party's founding principles extend beyond mere electoral contests. Amba, represented by Professor Theophilus Undubaku, at the Commission's meeting with stakeholders to rebuild the Labour Party, stressed that the party stands as an ideological movement dedicated to promoting good governance and accountability in political leadership. The NLC Political Commission aims to realign successive leadership within the Labour Party, announcing plans to establish a transition committee tasked with organizing an inclusive and expansive convention from grassroots ward congresses to the national level. Dr. Tanko Yanusa Obi, speaking on behalf of Peter Obi, echoed calls for peaceful reconciliation of internal disputes within the party. This was recognized by the immediate past leadership of the Labour Party as a fulcrum for the reorganization of the Labour Party, especially given the long-drawn crisis that has bedeviled the Labour Party and scuttled her progress. The crisis in the Labour Party is unfortunate and this development in this party is also inconsistent with the ideals of the founding fathers of the Labour Party, which was established as a political vehicle wheeled on the ideology of social democracy for all Nigerian workers, professionals, markets, women, and men, youths, farmers, and the masses of our people. The Labour Party was founded just for the purpose of contesting elections. It was not founded just for the purpose of con uh, conducting elections or con contesting elections. The party is an ideological movement which primarily purpose is the conscientization of Nigerians on the need to foster good governance, account accountable political leadership, and consensus for national development based on the principles of social democracy. The contestation of elections into public political positions is only consequent on the mobilization of Nigerian workers and people around the ideals and ideology of social democracy, good governance, and public accountability. We now tell you that the Socio-Economic Rights and Accountability Project has directed its focus squarely on President Bola Tinubu, urging him to shed light on Nigeria's loan agreements dating back to 1999. In a statement released on Sunday by the organization's Deputy Director, Kolawali Uluadari, Serap called on President Tinubu to compel relevant government agencies to provide copies of loan agreements secured during the administrations of former presidents, namely Obasanjo, Aradua, Jonathan, and Buhari. Serap emphasized the importance of transparency by requesting not only the agreements themselves, but also detailed spending information related to these loans, including interest payments made thus far. The organization stressed that making these agreements publicly available would empower Nigerians to scrutinize them and demand accountability for how borrowed funds have been utilized. This move comes amidst growing concerns over Nigeria's debt burden and calls for greater fiscal responsibility from government officials. Now, the Federal Road Safety Corps has issued a warning regarding false recruitment notices circulating online. Since April 4, 2024, a deceptive recruitment notice has been making rounds on various online platforms, enticing potential applicants with promises of opportunities within the FRSC. However, Corps Marshal Dauda Biu, through spokesperson Jonas Agu, has stepped forward to clarify the situation, urging the public to disregard any misleading claim. In an official statement, Argo emphasized that there are no ongoing recruitment processes within the FIC, nor are there any plans for such in the foreseeable future. B reiterated that this warning serves as a stern reminder for individuals to be cautious of fraudulent entities spreading misinformation, emphasizing that the FIC will not assume responsibility for any consequences resulting from such interactions. 
And then from that, we'll tell you that the organized labor comprising the Nigerian Labor Congress and Trade Union Congress has demanded 615,000 naira as the minimum wage for workers in the country. An executive of the organized labor who did not want to be named because he was not authorized to speak on the matter said that the new wage of 615,000 naira monthly was reached after consultations by the NLC and the TUC. The source, who was a member of one of the subcommittees set up by the government to work on getting a new minimum wage for the country, however said the wage might still increase following the recent hike in electricity fees. In the meantime, the federal government says about 85% of Nigerians are still enjoying the electricity subsidy in the country, despite the over 1 trillion naira that would be saved from the fresh tariff hike. It stated this in response to the continued reactions from Nigerians over the increment in electricity tariff recently announced for Band A customers by the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission. The NERC had on April 3 announced the tariff increment for Band A power consumers from 68 naira to 225 naira per kilowatt per hour with immediate effect. The regulator had said that the new tariff signified a removal of electricity subsidy for Band A consumers who constitute about 15% of the total number of power users across the country. So cool to that, the National Union of Electricity Employees has asked the federal government of Nigeria to withdraw the new increase of tariff, saying it will push the price of goods upwards and affect the poor. Recall that the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission had on April 3 increased electricity tariff for customers enjoying 20 hours of power supply daily who are said to be under the Band A classification. With the tariff increase, these customers are paying 225 naira per kilowatt per hour from the current 66 naira. In a letter to the Minister of Power, NUEE described the increase as absurd for a country already facing steep increases in prices of goods and services. While calling for the withdrawal of the new tariff as it is not beneficial to Nigerians, NUEE said the st safety of its members was at stake and at the risk of being attacked by people in the community when they visit for disconnections. Let's uh, move on to tell you that the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission has issued a stern warning to business across the nation amidst concerns over arbitrary price increases. In a statement released on Sunday, the FCCPC made it clear that it will not tolerate any form of price fixing. It emphasized the detrimental impact such actions have on consumers' financial well-being and the stability of the nation's economy. The agency specifically pointed out the nefarious practices of price gorging and conspiracy to manipulate supply, stating that these actions violate existing laws. The Commission urged the Nigerians to be vigilant and report any suspicious price hikes on fair trade practices they encounter. The National Identity Management Commission says the new National Identity Card is a single multi-purpose card and not three separate cards. The head of corporate communications at NIMC, Kayade Adeguke, disclosed this. On April 5, the commission announced that it had collaborated with the Central Bank of Nigeria and the Nigeria Interbank Settlement System to launch a new card with payment functionality for all types of social and financial services. According to the NIMC, the new national ID card is a single, convenient, and general multipurpose card, eliminating the need for multiple cards. NIMC adds that the single general multipurpose national payments card, called GMPC, has multiple use cases that includes payments and financial, including government intervention and services, with travels, amongst other uses. Joining us on the news at this time to discuss this further is Dr. Oludari Akinlaja, Managing Director, Managing Partner, Rada, oar and d Company. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Akinlaja, on the news. Thank you for having me. Thank so, you. So, yeah, so first, are you impressed about this new multiple postcard that is to be used by Nigerians? Um... <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you say impressed, um, it sounds beautiful, uh, but, I, but I don't think it is necessary. 
Uh, what I mean by that is uh, we have too many, too many conflicting uh, 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 policies coming up. Uh, it's just going to make it a bit more complex. Okay, uh, the national identity card we already have. People are finding it difficult to assess at some point. It's a bit cumbersome. You then don't want to create another, create another. So I, you know, sometimes I get tired of the, of doing too. We are trying to do too many things when I think there can be a simpler way to get it done. Yeah, so that, that's, that's what I think, really. <laughs> and a lot of people have talked about um, the need for the harmonization of Nigeria's database so as to eliminate these multiple cards and um, multiple banking of the Nigerian population. So don't you think, well, you said it anyway that um, you're not too um, comfortable with this new initiative, but then don't you think um, it is high time that at this point Nigeria harmonizes its database? Yes, we should harmonize our database, but do you need a card to harmonize your database? <laughs> <laughs> you don't need a card. Globally, you just, everybody just has a social security number. It's an identity tag that identifies you anywhere that you go. Uh, uh, we have the BVN, we have the NIN, we have the, you know, so there are too many, too many conflicting uh, numbers, as the case may be. You know, the way data works, you know, data assigns figures and numbers to people. All right. So if you say on one card you have a BVN, on another card you have your account number, on another you have your voter's registration number, on another you have so those are two men. Can each person just have one social security or identity number? That's the most important. The card is not the issue. Can you have a unified or one identity on the database in the bank, in the hospital? In the police station, in the in, in government, you have one identity number. That's that's what is important. Really. Mm. Well, we don't know whether the previous cards will be eliminated, but the Nigerian government has come out to say that this is a multi-purpose card that will be used for payments, for finances, transactions, identification, even government services, accessing uh, private services, travels, and all that. Uh, but the question I want to ask is, um, as regards this card, do you think there are potential challenges or maybe drawbacks uh, that, are, that might arise as a result of this multiple postcard because basically it will have all the information of a particular individual uh, residing on this card. So would there be issues uh, regarding this card holding so much information? A million and one issues. So if I have an account in Access Bank, I have an account in GT Bank, are you going to tell me that GT Bank and Access Bank will share that kind of data? Okay, <laughs> so, so it's going to be a lot of issues. Globally, people have multiple payment cards. It's not, that, that's, that's not the issue. It's still the same identity thing I'm talking about. And, and, and we need to understand how this thing works. You know, it, it's an identity. You want every Nigerian to have an identity. Okay, so you have a different number on your passport. It, it's going to bring conflicting issues. And, you know, so I, I'll take that card. I want to go and pay for something. I use that card. I'm going to go to Access Bank. How am I going to load the card? Which bank will load the card? I have four accounts. So how am I going to do it? You know, so this is <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of things we have not thought about in having these conversations. Uh, so so uh, and also one very important thing which which a lot of Nigerians will be conscious about is how safe is my data really? You know, if you are putting all of my information, my banking information, my on one particular card, how safe is it? And that calls to question the need for the protection of um, people's data. Now, let's just move forward from here. Um, now we have a multiple postcard that contains information of people, virtually all the information, without looking at um, the potential bottlenecks and all. What do you think the Nigerian government can do back end to ensure that information stored on these cards are safe and people's information are not um, compromised and data are not breached? Let's allow people do their job, okay? I'm sure uh, this particular project is going to be handed over to professionals. One of the things we must allow to happen in Nigeria a lot more is to allow professionals do their jobs. Let's, let's, let's avoid any form of politicking. Let's avoid any form of, uh, of, of trying to um, twist anybody. Let the, let the just, this is data we're talking about. This is people's identity we're talking about. Allow professionals you know, do their job, you know, if you can outsource it to maybe some form of professionals and allow them do their job, I'm sure it's going to be done, you see, because 
there's really nothing new under the sun if i must say you know <laughs> so there are people who are good at this who are good at protecting people's identity it's not it's not really rocket science the issue is anything that is having or uh, has government involved in it if you just allow the people that have been given that responsibility to carry out that task allow them get their job done avoid any politicking avoid any i'm twisting any who do any trying to you know cut, cut, just just let them do their job i'm sure we can get the best out of it okay uh dr ludaria kilaja managing partner oar and d company thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us we appreciate that thank you for having me thank you Many thanks for being there. Let's talk security now. Troops of the Joint Task Force Northwest Operation Hadar in Daji have killed several bandits and recovered some weapons and assets. OPHD's Information Officer Suleiman Omali said the development was part of a continued offensive against extremists. He said in a subsequent mop up patrol, the gallant troops recovered significant weapons and assets from the scene, including one AK 47 rifle, one magazine, two rounds of 7.62 millimeter special ammunition, one locally made gun, one DIN gun, and 18 cows. He stated that 10 motorcycles belonging to the terrorists were recovered and destroyed on the spot. Elsewhere, fresh crisis seems to be brewing in Delta communities over a disputed parcel of land between Afesere and Ogboa communities, both in Ugeli North local government area of Delta State, south-south Nigeria. This is coming barely a few months after some communities within the states couldn't resolve the differences that led to the loss of lives and property. New Central's correspondent Austin Azu completes the reports. Ogbowa and Afusere communities are both of Ugele Kingdom in Delta State. Both communities are said to have good records of cordial relationship over the years, especially when attributed to their intermarriages commerce, culture, and traditions. Leaders of Ogbonwa community have converged on this hall to address the recent developments in their area. They accused a neighboring officer community of erecting two signposts at the center of their community within scriptures as welcome to officer extension, goodbye from officer extension. It is indeed not only worrisome but also highly provocative that the officer used pull down the signboard of Ogbonwa Secondary School and in its place erected their second signboard. However, by the special grace of God, Ogbonwa youths who were visibly angry were restrained by elders of Ogbonwa community from confronting the officer youths while in the process of erecting the signboards. All efforts made by the elders of Ogbonwa community to resolve the issue through dialogue with Afisere people have so far proved abortive. Meanwhile, Afisere community leaders have revealed that the people of Ogbonwa are customary tenants in their community as they denied having any land disputes with her neighbor, Ogbonwa. The, the ancestral home of the Ogbonwa community is located between two to three kilometers from the present day Ogbonwa community. The pertinent question is that, is it wrong that after community secured their land by erecting a signpost of their land? To advert another land dispute related crisis in Delta State, it is expected that the state government would activate all mechanisms to urgently intervene in the pending crisis between both communities. In Ugele, Delta State, for News Central, I'm Austin Azu. The abduction of over 270 schoolgirls in Chibok in Bordeaux State, north central Ni northeast Nigeria, in 2014, shook the world and brought attention to the threat of Boko Haram in the region. Ten years after, New Central's Omaru Kirawa travels down that road to Chibok in search of how the rescued girls and their families and those who still have their daughters in the cold hands of terrorists are coping.
It is a journey of over 290 kilometers from Meduguri, the Borno state capital, through Konduga, Bama, Goza, Askiraoba to Chibok town. The smile of Naomi Adamu, one of the rescued Chibok school girls, welcomed us to the town. On April 14, 2014, the town of Chibok in Nigeria experienced a horrifying incident when the Boko Haram stormed government girls' secondary school Chibok and left forcefully with 276 of the girls. Ten years after, life seems to have moved on for many. The international rage has disappeared, leaving behind faded hope for the community where dozens of girls who were taken from their homes and family have remained in captivity. The fundamental problem started from day one, when the government of the day refused to recognize that there was a big problem at hand, and they delayed for almost two weeks before it took action. The Nigerian government's efforts in recent years to locate and rescue some of the abducted girls have been met with both success and challenges as many families are still in anguish. Around 90 of the abducted girls are still unaccounted for. Government should make life beautiful, should make life lovely, should uh, provide job opportunity for our teaming youth in order to uh, uh, prevent uh, future occurrence of such abduction. The social media campaign hashtag bring back our girls campaign has been one of the strongest voices advocating for the girls' safe return. So we are calling on government to use technology into it. Secondly, we are also calling on government to take into confidence the community leaders, the people in the community, to share information with them. Available data shows that 48 of the parents have passed away. The primary cause of their deaths were reported to have been a medical emergency called stroke which is directly connected to excessive mental pressure. The loss of my baby has made me something different. I have a scam on me that the wound has not even healed. And that scam, I think, till death. Maybe that scam will lead me to death, I don't know. The thing is that my life is with God. That's why I'm breathing with Him. If not, if from my own heart, I would have been dead by now. Over 1,600 students have been abducted from their school in different states within the country. Some rescued, others still in captivity, among who Leah Sharibu, is a sad reminder. Despite the passage of time, the pain of those dark days remain obvious in Chibok and beyond. Families of the abducted girls hold on to hope as they await news of their loved ones, praying for their safe return. In Chibok for New Central, Omoru Kirawa. Uh, between the 2014 abduction of students in Chibok and now, there has been over a dozen of attacks on schools where students and teachers were either kidnapped or killed. This next report by New Central's Uzonna Ononye helps us better understand how unsafe schools have become in the last 10 years. His report. The report by the Save the Children initiative says that about 1,700 school children have been kidnapped within the last 10 years. About 180 children and 14 school staff also lost their lives in the attacks within the same period. Let's just try to help you make better sense of all of this. There have been several, but we'll pick a few to understand. And first, we begin with Government Girls Secondary School in Chibok, Boronu State, the incident took place on April 14, exactly 10 years today, and it took it led to the kidnap of 270 plus schoolgirls. This triggered 
um, widespread outrage leading to the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, foreign and local forces lashed out on the incident and, you know, on the government of the day led by President Goodluck Jonathan, and government began to react two weeks after silence, two weeks after of keeping quiet and perhaps not sure of what really happened. Many were freed several years, but we understand that some dozens, as a matter of fact, are still in captivity. It didn't end there. We went ahead to see again from Government Girls Science and Technical College, Yobe State, on February 19, 2018, where 110 school girls were kidnapped. Five of them died on the day of the abduction, and 104 of them were released on March 2018. One of them, Leah Sharibu, everyone will remember, is still in captivity. The next incident we are monitoring took place at the Government Science Secondary School in Kankara, Zamfara State on December 11, 2020, where about 300 students were abducted. The governor of the state then um, said that the BAT Allah was responsible for securing their release. That's quite interesting. And then we move to the next incident we are tracking from Government Science College, Kagara, Niger State, February 17, 2021. 27 students were abducted from their school. One died in the gunfire that led to the abduction. Three staff of the school and 12 of their family members were also taken. 42 of them were freed 10 days after from captivity. And then the next we are looking at is at Government Girls Secondary School, Jangebe, Zamfara State, on February 26, 2021. 317 students were abducted from their school in one night, and the so called bandits were held responsible. Zamfara State Government shot all boarding schools in reaction. The hostages were released a few days after on March the 2nd, 2021. Next school we are looking at is Salihu Tanko Islamic School in Niger State on May 30, 2021. 150 students were kidnapped from this school in one operation. One of them who was shot in the process later died. 88 days after being with the abductors, these children were freed. And then the next school we are looking at, which appears to be the most Recent is LEA Primary and Junior High School, where about 300 pupils and students and teachers also were abducted in the morning. And so-called bandits again were held responsible. Then the interesting thing is that 137 of them were freed after, which created a kind of confusion on what exact number that were kidnapped in the first instance. However, what is most important is that they are free. A teacher unfortunately died in the hands of the abductors. The children were later reunited with their families three days after in Kaduna. But also remember, they were kidnapped in Kaduna but released in Zamfara State. If you connect these dots, you will understand what is, how serious the situation had been. There are several of these incidents, several of them, but we chose to look at these few to broaden our thoughts and make us better understand the magnitude of the situation we have in our hands. Successive governments have made different shades of promises to protect schools and end insurgency in Nigeria. These 10 years and the records of incidents with, on the table that we all can see within the period may just be a measurement of the sincerity or lack of it from the authorities in keeping these promises. And joining us on the news is um, Satu Alamin. She is a human rights activist. Uh, um, Alamin, can you hear me? Good evening to you. Hello, Alamin. Okay, I think um, we'll get back to that during the course of our bulletin, if time permits, to bring um, Satu Alamin to talk to us more about this. But then, uh, let's move on to tell you that as mothers in the Catholic Church in Nigeria celebrates the 2024 Mother's Day, they have been called upon to live up to their roles naturally assigned to them by nature. Mothers at Mater Dei Cathedral Parish received admonitions from the Bishop of Humaya Diocese, Most Reverend Michael Upong, who urged them to strive to maintain the home front the same way they make efforts in the church. 
the wife of Abia State Governor Priscilla Oti and Deputy Governor Engineer Ikechuku Emetu also emphasized the many impacts of mothers. The theme for the 2024 Mother's Day is motherhood, a call to perform a sacred and supreme vocation. It is because through motherhood we have the power to shape the destiny of nations, to instill values of love and compassion and faith in the hearts of our children and to leave a lasting legacy of goodness and grace. You are just right for the job. And not only is that a sacred calling, it is an immense blessing. To be called out among men and chosen to be a mother is a sacred calling and honor. Whether your children are born of your womb or not, God keeps you precious mother. Please, as women, continue being patient with us. Amen. Many a time, the economic situation doesn't make us romantic. Motherhood encompasses something that gives joy to the world and it's to be celebrated. Let's now take you to the east of the continent where heavy rains and flooding have killed at least 58 people, including children, in Tanzania since the beginning of April. April marks the peak of the rainy season in Tanzania. On Friday, eight school children died after their bus plunged into a flooded gorge in the north of the country. A volunteer in the rescue operations also died. Over 10,000 households have been affected and over 75,000 farms have been damaged by flooding in the coastal and Morogoro areas, 200 kilometers west of Dar es Salaam's economic capital. In Central Africa, about 15 civilians have been killed in weekend attacks in the Benin region in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo in new attacks blamed on ADF rebels affiliated with the Islamic State. 14 civilians were said to have been killed on Friday in several places in the neighborhood and a new attack targeted another on the night of Saturday to Sunday, leaving two more people dead. Among the latest deaths are a woman and a police officer. The assailants attacked and set fire to a health center from which they looted medical supplies in an incident similar to two weeks ago in another Benin commune called Mangina, which saw 10 people killed. Moving on now, Cameroon's Royal Bamoon Museum has been inaugurated by the King of Bamoons, Nabil Mbombo Njoya. At the inauguration, Mbombo Njoya described it as a great work that marks history and impacts the consciousness of present and future generations. More than 10,000 works spread across several rooms of the museum and now open to visitors who can discover the Bamoon cultural heritage dating back more than 500 years. Doter le peuple Bamoun, le Cameroun, l'Afrique et le monde d'une grande œuvre qui marque l'histoire et qui impacte les consciences et les actions des générations actuelles et futures, telle était sa vision. Aujourd'hui, des gens cherchent leur histoire, ils veulent savoir d'où ils viennent, qu'est-ce qu'ils ont fait, qu'est-ce qu'ils ont traversé. Cette, ce palais, ce musée aujourd'hui permet de tracer cette histoire. Et ça permet de vivre l'histoire, sentir l'histoire. Quand vous entrez, vous regardez les artefacts, vous pouvez toucher de droit l'histoire du Cameroun. Et ça, c'est très important pour nous, encore plus les Bamoun, voir comment nos droits ont évolué de génération en génération, tout ce qu'ils ont légué, les créations, l'écriture, le chemin et tout ça là, pour moi, c'est extrêmement important. C'est agréable de voir l'évolution de ce musée. Moi, j'étais déjà à Fumban quand la première pierre a été posée. Et euh, je trouve que c'est un beau parcours et euh, c'est une très, très, très belle réalisation. Et euh, alors moi je ne suis pas là en tant que touriste, mais euh, je pense que c'est quelque chose qui va amener beaucoup de rayonnement à la cité de Pumban. Euh, non seulement ce que vous voyez est une partie de ces œuvres, mais nous comptons beaucoup plus sur les retombées économiques et au-delà de l'économie, du développement en général que ce musée peut générer dans la population. From other continents, we'll tell you that European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen says that the leaders of the G7 nations have condemned Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel, calling for maximum restraint from all parties. The group of the world's seven major advanced economies also reaffirmed its solidarity and support with Israel, von der Leyen added. 
before urging for an increased delivery of humanitarian assistance to Palestinians in need. Iran launched the attack, its first ever, to directly target Israeli territory, in retaliation for a deadly airstrike widely blamed on Israel that destroyed its consular building in Syria's capital early this month. Iran launched a massive attack against Israel using drones and missiles. Such a direct Iranian attack against Israel is unprecedented. Today, we, the leaders of the G7, condemn this in the strongest terms. We expressed our solidarity and support to the people of Israel and reaffirmed our unshakable commitment towards its security. Iran's actions risk provoking an uncontrollable regional escalation, and this has to be avoided. We will continue to work to stabilize the situation. We call on Iran and its proxies to cease completely the attacks. All parties should exercise maximum restraints. In the meantime, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu holds war cabinet meeting in Tel Aviv a day after Iran launched an unprecedented wave of missiles and attack drones against Israel in retaliation for a deadly airstrike that destroyed its consular building in Damascus early this month. Israel was on high alert on Sunday after Iran's unprecedented attacks sparked fears of a broader conflict. Iran launched its first ever direct assault on Israeli territory late on Saturday and it marked a major escalation of the long-running covert war between the regional foes. The assault saw Iran fire more than 300 drones and missiles towards Israel late on Saturday, injuring 12 people, the Israeli army said. In northern Kazakhstan, flooding has submerged swaths of the city of Petropavlovsk where rescuers have carried out preventive evacuations the day before. Residents of the affected districts blame insufficient funding by the authorities for flood prevention inspections and infrastructure which could have avoided the disaster. This is widespread flooding in the Russian Orals regions and neighboring Kazakhstan which has caused the melting of ice and swelling of rivers exacerbated by heavy rainfall. At this point, we now join our business desk for business news. Hello and welcome to Business News. Analysts expect oil prices to rise on Monday after Iran's attack on Israel over the weekend. However, further gains may depend on how Israel and the West retaliate. Concern of a response from Iran to the strike on its embassy compound in Damascus supported oil last week and helped send global benchmark Brent crude on Friday to $92.18 per barrel, the highest since October. It settled that day up 71 cents at $90.45, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude futures rose 64 cents to at $5.66. Iran has steeply raised oil exports, its main source of revenue under the Joe Biden administration. The World Bank Group has credited interest rate increases by the Central Bank of Kenya and a partial settlement of Kenya's debut eurobond for the shillings rally seen since mid-February. According to the multinational lender, the higher benchmark lending rate by the CBK has amounted to a defense of the local currency, while the partial repayment of the eurobond notes maturing in June has revived demand for the shilling. The shilling has been the biggest gainer among currencies in sub-Saharan Africa on a year-to-date basis, alongside the Zambian Kwacha, which has shared some of its gains. CBK undertook two consecutive raises of the benchmark interest rate in December and February, setting the central bank rate at 13% from 10.5%, with the primary goal of cushioning the shilling by attracting foreign exchange flows into local investments such as government securities. And finally, Somalia is banking on new opportunities coming out of recent debt relief to seek new credit lines and open for trade. 
Despite security challenges and ongoing state rebuilding, Somalia's ambassador to Kenya, Jabril Ibrahim Abdul, says Somalia is yearning to play a big role in the region and the international stage. In December, Somalia reached an agreement to cancel $4.5 billion of debt with international lenders. That, the diplomat says, gave it new opportunity to attract investors as well as be eligible to borrow more from lenders. So far, Mogadishu has been cautious of simply piling new debt and officials have said they will prioritize opening up and rebuilding state institutions instead. It's a wrap on Business News at this hour. Thank you for watching. I am Perpetra Fasame Peter. The news continues shortly. Bye for now. Sports news comes up next. In sport, Victor Bodyface scored and provided an assist as Bayer Leverkusen beat Veda Bremen 5 0 to land their first ever Bundesliga title. Bayern Munich beat Cologne on Saturday to keep Leverkusen's title celebrations on hold for at least a day. But there were scenes of jubilation for Zabi Alonso's team when the final whistle blew at the Bayer Arena on Sunday. Nigeria's Victor Boniface 25th minute penalty set Leverkusen on their way before Granit Xhaka and Florian Ritz scored stunning goals in quick succession. Supporters stormed onto the pitch in mid-match when Starman Ritz added a fourth in the 82nd minute and again when he completed a hat-trick soon afterwards. Leverkusen's landmark achievement ends an era of dominance for Bayern, who had won the past 11 Bundesliga titles. It is a first league title for Super Eagles duo of Nathan Teller and Victor Boniface. Congratulations to Sabi Alonso side. Still talking football, Super Eagles striker Victor Osimia was on target as Napoli were held to a 2 2 draw by Frosinon in Sunday's Serie A game. The Nigerian international, who has made 20 appearances, has netted 13 goals and bagged three assists this ongoing season for Napoli. Politano opened the scoring with a fantastic finish, cutting inside from the right to bend the left foot finish into the far top corner from the edge of the area. However, Frosinone were gifted equalizer when Merit was caught in possession by Sule, sluggishly playing out from the back, allowing Chidera to sweep into an empty net. Napoli restored the advantage when Karapskelia hit a right-footed scorcher that Torati flew to palm over the bar. On the resulting corner, another Karapskelia shot was deflected turning into an accidental assist for Osime to turn in from six yards, kept on side by Emmanuel Valeri, slowly tracking back. Away from Italy now to England, where Aston Villa inflicted a blow to Arsenal's hopes of a first Premier League title for 20 years as late goals from Leon Bailey and Uli Watkins earned a 2 0 win at the Emirates Stadium. Meanwhile, Liverpool's shock 1 0 home loss to Crystal Palace earlier on Sunday leaves Manchester City two points clear at the top of the table with six games remaining. Eberichi Eze converted from Tyreek Mitchell's cutback to finish off a flowing Palace move early on, and the visitors were deservedly in front at the break. Jurgen Klopp's red ramped up the pressure in the second half, but just as in recent games against Manchester United and Atalanta, their finishing let them down as they fell to a first league loss at home since October 2022. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, we take a look at some of our major stories. Nigeria's Labour Union submits 615,000 Naira minimum wage demand. About 15 dead in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Finally, we told you that 58 people were killed in Tanzania's flood so far in April. Do send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number and email on your screen. You can follow us on social media via at News Central TV. You can also watch News Central live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Likon Onobanjo.